Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back to a welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of the growth of politicalisms in the late 1800s, right? Actually, not the late 1800s, in the mid 1800s. So, the big thing about it that we've been talking about in class, right, was a very, very difficult discussion of a lot of words on slides that made a lot of y'all very upset. But it's okay. It's not a big deal, okay? You're going to get over it. It's going to be fine, all right? So, now look. The thing about it that we tried to discuss and tried to really lay out there is that following the exile of Napoleon, after he had taken over all this different stuff, and as the ideas of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment had begun to spread throughout the rest of Europe, right? People, oh, they want rights. They want constitutions. Absolutism's bad, which is all very true, right? So the big thing about it is you're going to see the rising up of political isms that want to try and either agree with these sentiments or disagree with these sentiments, right? Now, the big ones that we talked about in class is we talked about the Congress of Vienna, right, getting that balance of power back together, right? We also talked about conservatives and who they are, right, the upper, upper class of people like Clemens von Metternich and Edmund Burke and people like that who are going to try and be like, no, absolutism is the way to go. You don't know what you need. You don't know what you want. Let's keep power in the upper classes. And then also we talked about classical liberals, right? Now, classical in like parentheses because liberals today would not be considered classical liberals. Classical liberals today would actually be considered more of a conservative mindset, right? Now, the goals of classical liberals, of course, were the exact opposite of the, well, not the exact opposite, but kind of in the middle between conservatives and this third group that we'll actually talk about, right? The goals of classical liberals included growing that industrial revolution, laissez-faire economics, no absolutist government, constitutions that protect the rights of all men and stuff like that, giving people the right to vote, some people anyway, right? So like, and then also expanding legislative bodies, growing wealth of society, and they represent mainly the middle class, right? The growing bourgeois and stuff like that. Or you could also argue the growing industrial middle class. They are big time classical liberals, right? Now the third and final like, like one, which you may have to pause this and actually finish writing it because I'm going to move through it pretty quick. The thing about it though is, is like, you know, you just got to write kind of stuff like this. The third one is going to be a radical one, right? The radical one that would break European society completely and really comes out of left field, right? And they are known as socialism, right? So socialists or socialism really, really tend to represent the very, very lower class, right? They represent the workers and things like that, and they represent more so the poor people. Now, the people who organize the socialist party thought ideas or socialist issue ideas are not themselves poor because you have to be educated to have these ideas and stuff like that, but they want to represent the poor, and they're basically saying that the poor are being taken advantage of, right? The biggest thing about socialism is that they believe that individualism is a bad thing, right? They don't like the idea of capitalism and a dog-eat-dog -dog society because they think it fractures the idea idea of collectivism and communities, right? They want smaller communities because they actually believe in the ideas of Rousseau, right? That cities are these giant evil things that have actually pitted man against each other. Socialists, on the other hand, believe that we should be living in smaller communities where we do and like do certain jobs to benefit the larger goal of all of us rather than just me and you, right? So it's the idea of that community idea. Now, socialism would eventually evolve later on into this thing. Well, not evolve completely, but some socialists would break away and then found things like communism, this being Karl Marx, the father of communism and stuff like that. So the thing about it, though, as well, is for socialism to work, it also requires universal suffrage, right? Suffrage right here. You see this word right here, suffrage? If you need to write this down, go ahead and write this down. But what suffrage is, it is the right to vote, right? So the socialists believe that everyone should get the right to vote, not a select few people. They also believe that kings are bad, period, right? None of those. We want legislative bodies in charge, people like parliaments. They also advocate for planned economies. So the government basically will sell certain items to people at a fixed price, right? So for example, they believe that the price of bread should never fluctuate with the market because some people will not be able to afford it, leading to starvation, illnesses or the act like the expectation of possibly early death right they believe that competition is a bad thing so they think capitalism is a bad thing they also though believe though in natural rights except the property one right they like life they like liberty but they think property is going to lead to us competing against one another and trying to have more than the other guy right so the other thing about it is they want to redistribute wealth and goods who likes this idea the industrial lower class lower end of the middle class but there are also a lot of types of socialists. There are utopian socialists, communists, and a lot of other people that we'll talk about a little bit later on, right? 
Now, the thing about it is that all these new politicalisms and all these new ideas is going to lead to a lot of really intense things that are going to go down in Europe in the next handful of years, right? No less than 30 or about 33 years, 33 years after the second time Napoleon gets exiled out of like Europe and stuff like that, there's going to be a wave of revolutions that sweeps over the entire continent, right? So it's really, really insane to think about the fact that the French Revolution was that effective of a thing because it caused chaos and nation building in Europe starting around 1848, right? Well, the reason why is like, Europe, what have you been up to in all this time? In those 33 years since Napoleon was exiled, since all those wars swept over the continent, since the British have been industrialized and stuff like that, what have you been up to? Well, it depends on who you ask, right? So something that you need to understand completely is that industrialism has begun to sweep the continent and change everything all over Europe, including the fact that it's taking your entire society from being agrarian like this and where most people worked on farms to actually turning it into something more like this, right? Into the production of factories and the production of iron and the smelting process and now growing into big issues including urbanization, pollution and the growth of cities that is now going unchecked, right? So we're now seeing a massive change in the European thought process, right? And the years of 1815 to 1848 are also referred to as the age of Metternich. Now, Metternich is this guy from Austria that if you are in an academic class, you don't need to know about as much. My honors kids talk about him a lot though, okay? His name was Clemens von Metternich though, right? And Clemens von Metternich is the guy that was like the socialist superhero who ran the Congress of Vienna. And he tried to figure out this whole balance of power thing, right? Well, something that's really interesting is he gave all of these big, like, like not rights, but he gave all this power to four countries in continental Europe, including France, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And the idea was we, now that the balance is power, now the power is balanced, will not fight one another. Instead, instead we'll just fight poor people in our country. But from 1858 to 1848, no one in Europe went to war with each other, right? Which is bananas. That's never happened before. And it might have been light on international war, but there was a lot of turmoil going on inside the countries. Because conservatives, the guys that we just talked about, they all want social order and absolutism back. The liberals, they all want more government participation. They want voting, sort of. And they also want economic independence, right? And workers, like socialists, they want food like so like they want bread right like so like that's a very simple thing they also want fair government participation and treatment in food like so like because literally there's gonna be a time period called the hungry 40s right so going into it though as well latin america all this is going on at the same time is liberating itself and people like simon bolivar to saint louverture and europe is in a lot of turmoil within each country to give you an example you do not need to write this down listen to me carefully you do not need to write this down you don't need to write this down it's just an example listen to me carefully if you have me on mute and you wrote down weenie and derp derp in your notes that's funny, and I'm going to know that you muted me, okay? But you do not need to write this down. But just to give you some ideas and context, all these conservatives thought that, oh, we're not going to war with each other. It's fine. Like, so, but it was so chaotic in some countries. Like, literally, France went through three kings in 30 years. Four, if you actually really, really look into it, okay? Because, like, this guy right here is the brother of Louis XVIII that was brought back following, like, the Congress of Vienna, right? Louis XVIII, or excuse me, Louis XVI's brother was Louis XVIII. Louis XVIII would come to power, but he would eventually die. This guy, Charles X, came to power and made everyone so mad that they had another revolution that actually went down in three days, right? So, like, now, and then also, of course, at one point or another, there was a guy named Louis the Nineteenth who was king for 20 minutes in like in like in France and then you got this dude who ends up coming to power named Louis Philippe right but what is it I'm trying to get at when I'm telling you this is that's how actually chaotic it was y'all they went through that many kings in three year, 30 years because they kept having little baby revolutions that would run people out of town right so the thing going into it is the liberal ideas of constitutional government is that they're spreading, right? They're spreading secretly. Organizations are getting together. They're fighting small little revolutions. They're trying to exert power over the conservatives. Things are really unstable, right? And another big thing about it as well is that revolts are going on all over the place, right? Now, this you need right here, okay? This you need. So the thing about it is take the ideas of a liberal constitutional government, not an absolutist one, getting rid of absolute governments, right? Take that idea of a liberal constitutional government, the ideas of John Locke, Baron de Montesquieu, and all these other Enlightenment thinkers that the French Revolution espoused and demonstrated 
Take that and start spreading it secretly throughout the continent, right? And then have your absolutists who are still trying to control these people who want parliaments and voting and rights and things like that. Of course, revolts are going to break out, right? Some of the big ones included one known as Peterloo. There was a Decemberist revolt that broke out in Russia and another big one called the Three Glorious Days. The Peterloo one literally was held in England and it was protesting failing laws that were giving rich people more money and starving poor people of money to buy food with. And so literally a cavalry came in and killed a woman and her child and 15 other people. The Decemberist one happened in Russia when literally the military was like, I don't want to fight for this new king. And the other group of the military shot all of them, right? And then also the Three Glorious Days was when literally the government of, like, or the people of France ran this guy out and this guy came to power, right? In three days. They had a revolution in three days. How wild is that, right? But also, take that and couple it with the fact that by the time the 1840s roll around, there's famines that are sweeping the entire continent, right? That's why they referred to it as the Hungry 40s, right? Food prices are beginning to skyrocket all over the continent due to bad harvests, right? So harvests were going down terribly, mainly due to a disease that was sweeping crops, not people, during the 40s, right? But food prices are really, really high, and what do socialists feel about fluctuating food prices? They hate it, right? This is why a socialist believes in planned economies, right? They're like, bread should never cost more than X because it's what poor people can afford, right? Well, the thing about it is, this is a very, very bad moment going on in European history. One of the biggest ones, the thing that ends up happening is this moment known as the Irish potato blight, the Irish potato famine, aka known as the Great Famine, right? The thing about it is that you need to understand is that this key event kind of led to the creation of the Hungry 40s. Well, what it was, was farmers in Ireland start harvesting their potatoes for the year. Now, potatoes were meant to feed the Irish while the Irish farmed wheat and barley that were supposed to go off and make bread, right? Well, they start digging up their potatoes and they start realizing that they have a disease, right? It's a disease called potato blight, right? And it affected the type of potato that they grew known as the common brown potato, right? Why did this happen? A lot of it had to do with that mass production farming. Farmers were, like, Irish farmers were being used to grow grain and then fed potatoes. Well, why the potato, though? Because populations were growing heavily in Ireland and potatoes were really easy to grow. But the third reason why the Great Famine happened is because of monoculture issues, right? They weren't growing a variety of potatoes. They were growing one type of potato, the common brown one. So if a disease comes through that affects that one brown one, what happens to all the food the Irish people are supposed to eat? It's all dead. Literally, the Incans farmed thousands of types of potatoes. So if a disease came through and affected one, they still had several hundred other potatoes they could eat. It's not a big deal, right? but they had given one type of potato to the Irish to actually use. This right here is a monoculture when we farm one type of a thing, whereas biodiversity will save lives. But you have to understand, monocultures made more money, right? So like it made more money for the British people growing all these grains. The results of the Great Famine and the Irish potato blight included mass immigration. Heavy numbers of Irish people are actually going to move to places like the United States, going into the port of New Orleans and into New York. And still to this day, y'all, listen to me very carefully. Still to this day, the Irish population has not recovered from the potato famine, right? There are still less people living in Ireland right now than there were living in 1830s Ireland, right? So results are going to be mass immigration, death from starvation and stillbirthing because women who weren't eating enough during the potato famine and stuff like that, if they were pregnant, the child would oftentimes die because they weren't giving the child enough calories, right? And also, it led to a rise in food prices because if the farmers are dying and the number of, and our supply of grain is going down, the price of the bread is going up, right? So you're seeing bread riots and things like that break out all over the continent. What this is going to lead to, this terrible situations, including the hungry 40s, is going to lead to this thing, these things known as the revolutions of 1848, right? The revolutions of 1848 was a series of dramatic and violent revolutions that broke out all over Europe demanding reform because people are sick and tired of this garbage. While the conservatives sit around like Clemens von Metternich and like, oh, we haven't gone to war with each other in a little while. Shut up, poor person. And literally are suppressing all these violent revolts and stuff like that. What finally happens is that the citizens of cities get together and they're like, we're gonna hold revolutions that they can't stop, right? And it was known 
as the springtime of the peoples, right? Because the classical liberals and the socialists are going to get together and hold a revolution against the conservatives, and it will sweep the entire continent. Y'all, 17 revolutions broke out all over Europe all at once in one year in 1848 in the same handful of months in March, right? One happened here, 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 here. All those little red dots are revolutions that broke out all over Europe, right? So getting into it, what were their demands? What did these people want? They wanted more government participation, as in they wanted legislative bodies like the Britons. The British had had the parliament the entire time. Notice really quickly, Britain doesn't have one of those little red dots. They didn't have a revolution of 1848 because they had a parliament the whole time. They want more government participation. They want a decrease in monarchical power. They want guaranteed rights that are outlined in a constitution and they want protection under the law. They want normal things that we as Americans today enjoy with our Bill of Rights and our Constitution and things like that. They want these same demands because they were living in countries that are still absolutist. And how are they gonna accomplish this? Some of you are like, well, I mean, I don't understand, Mr. Terry. Isn't the conservative army just gonna come in and crush these things under people like Clemens von Metternich? I like where your head's at, and you would be right. But their genius in their effectiveness came to the fact of what they built. The people of Europe, during these little revolutions, actually used the cities to their advantages, and they built these things called barricades, right? They would use scraps, trash, cobblestones, bricks, anything that they could find, and they would build a wall across a street, preventing the military from moving down it and giving them a thing to hide behind so they could pop up over the top and shoot at the military coming down the road, right? So literally such a genius thing. This right here is a barricade that was actually established in France. Something to give you a heads up, by the way, if there was, a met, if there was an Olympic sport that came to building barricades... The French would win it every single time, right? So going into it, what ends up happening is they actually get a lot of their demands. The conservatives give in. There's huge early success, right? Because literally, Francis King, that last, the third one, is going to abdicate the throne. And then they decide to get rid of a monarchy altogether. And they elect a president. And the guy's name is Napoleon III, who's actually, ironically enough, Napoleon's nephew. Fun fact, right? Now, some of you are like, well, what about Napoleon II? He's dead already. He died from tuberculosis in Austria, right? Now, new constitutions are going to be granted. Nation states are going to be formed instead of kingdoms, right? And people are going to identify with their countrymen rather with their, than with their king, right? So as you're seeing, these revolutions were huge. Yo, they're writing constitutions because the people of Europe went into the streets and built walls to prevent the military from moving down the road. And as you can tell, who did this together? The classical liberals and the socialists joined forces together to get these revolutions accomplished. And things were moving in a great direction. The people are getting their demands. They're getting the things that they want. Yes! But then they started fighting with each other. So like the biggest thing about it is they start arguing with one another as the revolutions progressed forward, right? When the conservatives gave in, when monarchs are abdicating, when we're getting presidents now in France and stuff like that, revolutionaries began to fight each other over different ideas. Now, suffrage is the best example because remember, liberals only want some people to vote. Socialists want everyone to vote. So in these early legislative meetings, in these new things like the Chamber of Deputies in France or the Landtag, or excuse me, the Frankfurt Parliament in Prussia, right? And all these new little like, like organizations, they start arguing over how many rights everyone gets, right? Because they disagreed on stuff. So what the conservatives are gonna do is they're gonna seize on this opportunity to overthrow those new constitutions and roll the reforms back a little bit. The only thing that really truly died because of these revolutions was the ideas of serfdom, right? Serfdom would be outlawed in many different countries, including Prussia and Austria, right? Different areas like of Europe would actually outlaw serfdom and feudalism finally and completely because of the revolutions of 1848. But a lot of the demands that the socialists wanted actually got rolled back. The only things that were really left around was some countries kept those legislative bodies and allowed people to continue to vote, right? But the thing about it is, is however these revolutions may have failed, they are a turning point in Western civilization because a new ism that is truly spreading and staying alive is an idea of nationalism, right? So like, and we will talk more about nationalism when I see y'all again in class. Y'all have a great rest of your weekend. See y'all soon.